Morning, folks. Great to see everybody. Um, <coughs> so I want to uh, talk today uh, a bit and start to think uh, today uh, about male-friendly interventions and services and therapies, but w w with a bit of a twist around actually what, what, what is safe for men and think about men and, and, and safety. So, <coughs> yeah, I, I think we can be a bit curious, start to be a bit curious around um, men <coughs> and safety because often we're quite skilled uh, at making good judgments about physical safety. If it's often if we're banging nails in, stuff like that, we kind of, we, we feel we're kind of good at that um, very often. Often it's part of our, or traditionally it's been part of our, our occupations too, the physical safety side. We're very used to making those sorts of judgments. But of course we do know that when it comes to help seeking for health issues, and in particular psychological health issues, that we can often show mild to, to very extreme reticence. Some of the time um, we know, we know from clinical practice that it can take guys days, weeks or months to come forward. Sometimes I know of guys where it's taken, it's taken over 10 years, over a decade, maybe even two, to um, uh, ask for help. And of course, there's an increasing body of research around that. Uh, some of the guys that we see, uh, some of the, our, our military veterans that we work with, uh, quite often say, I would rather have gone into, gone into battle than ask for help, because that's what they're used to. They're used to with the training. They're used to doing that, going into real uh, uh, danger. Much rather do that than, than go through the door to the GP or come and see the likes of me or another health professional. So it's, it's, it's curious. And we also know with recent research uh, into inflammation and stress, uh, Edward Bulmore's book, uh, highly recommended The Inflamed Mind from Cambridge, came out last year, I think. When we delay help seeking, it just fuels our stress cycle. Things don't get resolved, so we just end up feeling worse. Stuff gets, gets bottled up. Um, so it can be very difficult if, if uh, it feels uh, unsafe to, to, to get help. But then uh, another curious thing is, is once uh, guys uh, are through the door, very often, very quickly, there's a really marked change. So the whole presentation could change really, really quick. And I'm not sure we fully understand uh, s s some, of these, some of these things. So, you know, we can go from feeling basically uh, unsafe, can't go forward, can't go back, don't feel like I can go anywhere. That, that's, that's what it can feel like. Uh, and I remember going back 15 years during my training, thinking about, um, getting some psychological therapy myself, having all sorts of negative fantasies about how it was going to be, which held me back. Um, so it, it didn't feel safe to do it. And yet, when um, people do come through the door, uh, this is a still from one of our veterans programs, uh, very often there's a very quick shift in the atmosphere changes. It's uh, often a very... Good, it feels like a really good and safe place to be and good, good to be with, with each other as well. So it's, uh, there's a big shift goes on in, in the clinical setting. So why do, why do we men feel unsafe in particular settings? Well, I think some of it may be around uh, our status-seeking stuff uh, uh, and maintenance of our, our, our status, perhaps as, as a, an evolved response. I think if we look at uh, Jordan B. Peterson's uh, ideas about standing up straight with your shoulders back, trying to do it now a little bit, um, it's, uh, you know, some of that stuff goes back uh, a long way, potentially. That's, that may be part of the story. And also we know from the research going back 20 or 30 years plus that a lot of our experiences uh, as boys, infants, um, uh, very young, <coughs> some of our distress and difficult feelings get disavowed, often unwittingly, by our, by our caregivers, by our, by, our, by our parents, and also sometimes at school as well. So that emotional side gets, gets disavowed and kind of shut off to begin with. Then we've got very powerful, we know, cultural conditioning, traditionally, around masculinity is mercifully changing now, where the media stereotypes have been very powerful for a lot of us growing up. Um, sometimes there's an active conditioning process in the book, uh, Ed Fraser and Rod Eldridge do a super chapter on their experiences. Rod had uh, getting over 30 years in the, in the, in the forces in the UK. Uh, and the, the, there's, a, there's a strong flavour of, of 
masculine orientated uh, psychology during the during the, the training process, or certainly certainly there, there has been. Um, and when you've got all that going on too, psychological trauma when it happens, whether it's small t trauma or whether it's big t trauma, really kind of obvious stuff, all that's even more difficult to make sense of because our, our meaning making systems aren't working freely. So all these things, I think, and other stuff conspires to make uh, things more difficult when we're thinking about seeking help or maybe hold us back. And I think all these things influence our decision making processes. They certainly did for me when I was, uh, was, was younger and maybe still now. <clears throat> so in one way, what, what goes on but I think for, for many of us in, in the clinical settings is if we have a sense of distress, uh, we feel basically unsafe to, to, to do anything, say anything about it, so we don't say how we feel. And of course, we spin off into behaviours quite often, so it might be pick at the beer bottle, uh, doing other, other we externalise our distress, classically, there's lots of evidence for that, rather than um, doing something you would think would be, would be more... Uh, adaptive uh, and the paradox is or one paradox in the midst of all this I guess is that um, by, by uh, uh, avoiding help things actually which doesn't feel safe it actually makes things more dangerous so that's just one to again one to think through and I think at some level too um, <coughs> there's something here about informational exchange through, through a diff slightly different lens which is worth considering, because if I'm withholding some of my innermost stuff from uh, significant others, say, uh, at some levels, probably, myself and status, I'm perceiving them, no matter how bad things are, I'm perceiving them as, as valuable, because I'm concerned, potentially, about what other people might do with the information. That's one of the reasons, that's one of the things that might hold me back. Um, <coughs> so, from this perspective, the information about, about myself and the self can be seen as a very kind of precious but also fragile commodity uh, which I want to really keep hold of, um, uh, particularly when things are difficult and I'm, I'm under stress. So that information and exchange, particularly the verbal information and exchange, I'll only want to do that with really trusted others. And I think for that and other reasons, this is, this is why Robert Trivers' work around uh, de deception and self-deception with its evolutionary roots really interestingly kind of feeds into these debates uh, about actually what's safe, what, 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 is it possible for me to be honest about how I feel or, or, or not and in which contexts. Because <clears throat> we know, I know from personal experience, I know from professional experience, often when guys don't feel safe, defences go up. Up comes the drawbridge, not going out. Nobody, not things aren't coming in. There's not going to be much information going to and fro. That's that's you know we often talk about these sorts of defences. We, we, withdrawal. <clears throat> but what can we do to get beyond the uh, defences and increase men's sense of safety? And this is where the different interventions and the male-friendly work comes in. So remember, of course, that men do change their mind. I've changed my mind. Many guys that we see change their mind very significantly pre, mid to, to post therapy. It helps to have events like today. It helps to have publicly visible sources of help. So um, IAP services nationally are available, much more known about now. It really helps to have male-specific options that are badged, badged as such. In our trust, we've got... Uh, one thing we've got, we've got a, a football thing going on for guys, which re people really, they, they really value, and that, that's really spread. It helps, in our experience, to have things, new things embedded in the everyday. So locally to us is a thing called the, the 12th Man um, Project, where people go uh, and, and get positioned in businesses to talk about men's mental health, so it's a safe place for guys to come and talk. It works fantastically well. There's loads of this stuff now, as Martin said. It's helpful when it's accessible, too. So uh, uh, the, we know that having things uh, visible and accessible, but also uh, with an, uh, anonymous options for contact, uh, for example, like Calm, and um, uh, often I think probably the Big White Wall as well, can be really good for guys because it feels like a safe channel to start that contact. And above all, perhaps, you know, we, we talk about reverse engineering 
uh, in uh, therapies, interventions and services around men's needs and strength, as Mart has already touched on, that's something that really helps to make guys feel significantly um, safer. As an example of that, some of you will have heard about the Canadian um, Veterans Transition Programme, which is a cousin of our Veterans Stabilisation Programme, because that's was, it's been going for a long time now, and it's consciously adapted to the military mindset, really. So with the language, with the directness, with a, with a focus on mutual support. And there's a 20-year uh, evidence base, uh, so it's very strongly supported now. Also, zero suicides, very interestingly, from participants during the period. It's very popular. So as with our veterans programme, they, they get a lot of word of mouth referrals. So guys tell each other often that this is a, this is a good thing and it's a safe place to go. It's safe to make contact. Lo and behold, they've, you know, they've had significant waiting lists uh, over recent times. And we're all looking to up our resource. Um, and why is that? Partly is because guys are changing their minds about this because these things are starting to be known to be safe rather than potentially threatening and unsafe. There's lots of examples of this type of thing happening now. And seeing it through the lens of safety, I think, is useful. Because when we do feel safe, again, then the doors can open, the drawbridge can go down, and then the information can start to uh, be exchanged in a useful and, and, and therapeutic uh, way. And of course, when we do that, and I've gone working with numerous folks at the moment where this is the case, often it becomes a useful to perhaps even profound learning experience for the, for the guys involved. Often it will be become, in one or more ways, mutually enjoyable. Often there'll be humour around. Often, <coughs> especially towards the end of our veterans programme, the atmosphere will be, be quite fun and playful, e e even light. Uh, and at best, of course, it can be you know, life-changing, maybe even life-saving stuff. So it actually does become genuinely safe in all sorts of ways. That's at that's best. So <clears throat> just beginning to wrap up, how best um, to promote information exchange? I mean, that, that's one of the questions about, about men and safety. What do we need to do to make it more safe for guys in, in, the, in the male mind? Uh, well, we can consider the, the male psychology side, of course, very importantly. Consider that the, what we call the ratchet effects often in play, where guys will start off with a small amount of contact very uh, perhaps anonymous, and then in our experience, and then locally, and then build up to a fuller exchange of, of information and, and engagement. We can think about the choice architecture of our services. Traditionally, it hasn't been inviting because you had to self-disclose um, very early on. That's not always helpful. We know that puts guys off. Also, I think with a, with a, uh, uh, a view on the, uh, the, the, the psychology of priming, which is very important, really, we can, we can probably use language and priming much more helpfully to, to help guys um, in, engage. Might it be possible, for example, with, with AI, might there be kind of nudge options from that perspective, that actually giving us a bit of a reminder? Maybe, you know, you're feeling stressed, things aren't so good. Maybe it's time to actually just sort of touch base with somebody. Um, and, of course, many of the options that we'll hear about but the emerging international evidence, I think, for all this work, as uh, advertised in the, in the book, is, um, is, is uh, really promising, fantastic stuff. So, yes, that's uh, just a few thoughts about um, seeing this, these issues through the lens of, of safety. Thank you. Um, you say that men will sometimes wait years to seek help. And uh, I understand that, but why don't the police understand that? Because when I went about my abuse, they slapped a, a six-month time limit on it. They, they said between the uh, attack where I had evidence to the time I reported it was beyond six months. Mm, so mm. I'd run out of time. Mm, mm. And that's, and I, I, I know that you know, th these and similar things happen. I, I think what we're doing in many instances is we're still playing catch up. So this, a lot of this, these ideas is yet to filter through. We're doing our best, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it takes time. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Or? Yeah. 
just, just to add that you know, we find it very difficult to get men to speak. But in our ex certainly in, our, in the experience of our clinic is that what we do is we write out sentences that are very typical of the kind of problems that we see a lot of people having, men particularly. And they'll get a list of those and they'll ask them to read this. Mm -hmm. Any of those make sense to you? Any of those comments really resonate? And so on. What happens then is when they actually see something written, it's very familiar to what's going on in their head, you get them to speak. But asking them to come to that place, that's where it's different. Mm. I'm just mm. putting that mm. up because mm. the, you, you, it is, that's like priming. Yes, it is, exactly. Starting the pump yeah. and getting the Exactly, and that's, that's, that's fantastic because it's, it's, that, that's a, a clear enabler, isn't it? It enables the thing, and it also does one of the things that's most important is start to put the emotions and stuff into, into language. And Correct. if you're already doing that, fantastic. Thank you very much. Oh, one more. Can we take this last one? Hello. Um, one of the puzzles a lot of men have is that their normal anger response or frustrations to um, aggressive stimulus um, will be taken against them and used against them and turned back against them, um, effectively false allegations. Yesterday in the press, there was a lot of hoo-ha around MP Mark Field, who in a dinner um, had a lady standing behind him, got up, obviously angry, and ejected her from a room. Um, there are different perspectives about that incident, whether he was right, whether he was wrong. And the discussion around that incident has been quite vociferous um, in, the, in the law, in the press, and he's now in trouble you know, with, with potentially his career on the line. I don't know what the ins and the outs are of that scenario because I saw a video. However, I sympathize um, as an observer with that man's frustrations um, and sympathize with his response, which as an observer I thought was in the realm of normal, to remove somebody and take a, um, an active step to stop greater harm. Now, um, with scenarios between men and women, um, <coughs> one party is scared or one party is trying to do something. Both parties are scared of pushing an agenda. Some of those fears are real, some of those fears aren't. Men make mistakes, women make mistakes. What I think is a big problem is that there is now such an increased awareness of violence in its different forms, with its different array of what's violent, what's not, what's inappropriate, what's not, and what steps somebody should take to deal with, shall we say, an aggressor. Men are terrified that their normal response, that maybe one mistake, can be used against them and destroy them, whether that's so-called harassment, um, over-the-top verbal, verbal responses. Um, someone has a go at them, they, they shout back to some people that some kind of violent response, to others that's normal. And this is all very confused. Mm, 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 and mm. Um, as an observer and a party to some of this stuff, it's um, very, very scary. Mm. So that's my thoughts. False allegations and the fact that innocent, harmless, non-event can be taken and twisted by anybody and used as a weapon. And the fact that there are people around us in society, in the law, who will actively and aggressively back those individuals um, is something that needs to be discussed and explored. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment or we just... I think it's a, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's a good reflection, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So I saw the newspaper article yesterday as well, and I think um, 
although I, I came to yesterday's conference as well, and I think absolutely coercive control and false allegations, especially and when we were talking about how fathers um, are, have this sort of, um, I guess, abuse and power put onto them by uh, their ex-partners, for example, it's completely wrong, and I think it's something that isn't talked about much. But I think when I saw the article yesterday um, and the pictures of Mark Fields kind of grabbing the lady by the neck and kind of jostling her, it didn't look like it was completely okay. And I think um, although this topic is very important, I think we don't want to get confused with what is aggressive behavior that's, that's just not okay, whether a man or a woman does it to a man or a woman. Um, and confusing that with actually coercive control. And I've been being a trainee psychologist, I've been in therapy sessions when I've got young men um, who've had sexual inter interactions with women and um, they're really, really scared about what other people might think and if they got enough consent from uh, the woman that they were with. I think that's a completely different topic to something, uh, what well, my take on it was the photos didn't, you know, look very good. And also, you've got this in media with, for example, um, that lady, you know, the lady, the famous cook, she was in, uh, Nigella Lawson, yeah, she was in the papers a while back where her husband was, you know, physically aggressive towards her, and those pictures didn't look okay, but that's completely different, I think, to something where men are being falsely allegated, there's allegations, and that, that's wrong, I think, just to keep that in mind, I think. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. There's debate and there's, it's where we draw the line and what context is very important. I think those are things for sort of think about and to raise in our discussions uh, throughout the day. But I want to thank you, Roger, anyway. So I want to thank Roger for a fantastic talk.